and deeply shocked at what had happened. It wasn't long afterwards, actually. The, the ambulance arrived, and uh, one, one of the ambulance men came over to me, and another went off into the car park, and I heard, I presume it was him, shout, this one's going to be DOA, which is dead on arrival. I didn't realise it was John. I knew Sergeant Speed very well. He'd been a young detective of mine uh, for a number of years, uh, particularly at Chapel Town. And of course it did go through my mind the times we spent together while I was on my way there, particularly uh, some Christmases we'd spent together and different operations that we'd dealt with together. And of course I, I did think about his family. I'd heard that a third bullet had been fired. So uh, the task force came and they did a fingertip search with a view to finding anything, and particularly the bullet. I would just like to remind you that uh, when the gunman ran away from our two officers, he did run across the Garden of Rest, and we have obtained certain forensic evidence uh, from near the vehicle and in the Garden of Rest. He ran across the road to Brussels Street, along Brick Street, up New York Street, onto the grass area near St. Patrick's Church and ran across into the car park of the Woodpecker pub there at the bottom of York Road. He there had a great amount of luck. He jumped over the rear wall there into a garage forecourt where that van was just being filled with petrol and he hijacked the van at gunpoint. Get out of that! He then drove off up Shannon Street, and really that's the last uh, that we saw of him whilst he was with that vehicle. He went through the East End Park area of Leeds, and then the next site was near the post office at St Elmo Grove. And after we found the van, we did wonder whether he'd gone to some house nearby here. But you do realise that there is a post office over there. The back door is there, and uh, that morning, uh, the post office van, security van, was to arrive there to deliver cash. And we feel now that uh, the man walked round here, waiting for the van to arrive, so he could then commit the armed robbery. That enforced our armed robbery uh, theme. We felt that that was what he was about. And this was a man who just shot down two police officers only half a mile away from here. He was still going to wait for the, uh, for the van to arrive and commit that robbery. The absence of cartridge cases at the scene of the incident tended to rule out the involvement of a self-loading pistol. So we're looking preferably then at a revolver type firearm such as this. And the witness description of the time indicated the use of a long barreled black coloured revolver with a lanyard ring attached to its butt. Next thing that was very apparent to me was that there was no rifling impressions left on the bullet at all. Normally when a bullet is fired from a conventional firearm it travels down the barrel and in doing so it is engraved with a set of marks produced within the barrel. The bullets in this case had just fine scratch lines upon them. In other words, they've been fired from a crude, rough barrel. So this made them rather special. I've been through all the cartridges contained in our quite comprehensive reference collection at the laboratory. And uh, if you look at the bullet recovered from one of your officers in Lee's incident, with this bullet down here, then the actual disposition and the dimensions of the lubrication bands indicate these are Remington 38 target wad cutter rounds used in your incident. Um, I understand from inquiries that have been making that you brought a batch of bullets from Remington 38 polo based wad cutters, 148 grade, from Hull Cartridge Company. Can you tell me how many you've still got left in stock? Tracking down the origin of the bullets from that gun was virtually impossible but it was an inquiry they had to follow. A quarter of a million bullets had been made, and two importers and 130 gun dealers were contacted in an attempt to trace the customers. There was another clue that had to be checked out through a long and tedious routine. 
size 10 footprints showing clear shoe treads had been found. I'm looking for a particular type of sole on a shoe. Have you got any shoe for that particular sole? I don't know. I've only seen that sole on a high-tech green flash. Something like that. That's close, but it's not got this circle. OK, Ray, I'll see you tomorrow. A hundred thousand of these shoes had been made, 12,000 were size 10. All had to be traced. So too did anyone who might have seen the gunman and his accomplice when they ran into one of the most densely populated areas of Leeds. We're doing house house inquiries regarding a shooting of a police officer last Wednesday. Yeah. Two possible suspects. One's a uh, white male, 40, 42 years old. No, not at all. Short grey hair. He was wearing a checked black cap. We're the murder we're making inquiries regarding a blue Stanton's van parked outside your house. Do you remember that vehicle? Yes, I do. On the face of it, we had a lot, yet in truth we had so little. There were something like a hundred people at the scene or on the escape route who had had a glimpse of one or both of the assailants. Did you see the man that drove I saw away? the man, yes. 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 What did he look like? Just medium build, I would say. He was tall, um, at least six foot, probably or probably over six foot. The one with the hat would have been round about six foot, I would think. Would you know him again if you saw him? No. No. Now the information about about the gunman varied quite a lot, and the various photo fits that we had. Uh, I think illustrated the differences. For example, that one, said to be a man about 24 years of age with blonde hair. And then at the other end of the scale, a man here who looks more in the order of 60. And then the other two who were somewhere in between. I suppose the dilemma that the senior investigating officers got is which one is right anyway? on which ones should he put out to the public at large asking for information about people who fit that description and which should remain on file. And of course the one person who could identify the gunman was PC Thorpe, or could possibly identify, and I emphasise, could possibly identify the gunman. Mr Conboy had asked me to come back into Millgath to give an account of uh, what had happened that day to the investigating officers. And uh, I remember coming into the CID office, and I mean, he walked through the door, and there about 70 detectives there. You know, you know better get it right this time, sort of thing. Um, it was all right. I mean, it was just a matter of going through the events of the day and explaining to them and letting them, if they had any questions regarding the events, you know, that um, they wanted to ask Mr. Conboy asked me to, um, oh, picked out individual officers and uh, asked me to guess their ages and what have you because of the, just to ensure that um, the age that I'd put on the gunman was right. And uh, I think I did fairly well, uh, other than one who was a lot younger than he looked. I think after he was satisfied that um, I'd got the right sort of age uh, for the gunman, he then asked me if there was anybody in the room that uh, was of a similar build. And Peter Brook, the DS at that time, was uh, certainly the one that was most similar in build, the big heavy set fella. Could you come out then, Peter, please? Would you all have a real good look then at uh, Peter Brook? This is the type of man that we're looking for a heavily built man, round about 38, 40, big shoulders, very strong. When you knock on the next door and you see a man of this description, you want to be giving him a really good look. Hello, Bob. After six weeks, the inquiry had made little progress. So police went back to look at criminal records. They reopened their files on every armed robbery over the past ten years. That is no easy task because there are literally hundreds of armed robberies committed over that period of time. We had to look also at persons who have previously been convicted, persons who were suspected. And uh, again, we have to see how they fit in with our particular uh, murder. In fact, we came up 
at the end of the day with something like 10,000 suspects. We want you to be specific now as to where you were between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. Steady on. They generated something like 18,000 actions, that is, lines of inquiry, which in turn led to 43,000 names going into that system. And what I have to say about the 18,000 actions is that that amounted to eliminating people from the inquiry, which was what the investigation was all about, eliminating armed robbers and eliminating criminals from the murdering fire. Where police had no grounds to arrest suspects, John Thorpe was taken out to observe them. He was shown 9,872 faces, and though his assailant was kept on file, he didn't spot him. Meanwhile, the analytical team looking through armed robberies identified two attacks on an Asda supermarket that just might have been committed by the killer of Sergeant Speed. In both cases, witnesses said the gun had sounded tinny. In the first attempt, the supermarket manager was threatened. A shot was fired but the gunman fled without getting any cash. A year and a half later, the store was attacked again. This time, the manager was carrying over two and a half thousand pounds. The manager had been shot in the knee. The bullets from the Asda raids were compared with the murder of Sergeant Speed. They were of a different make and a slightly different caliber, but they lacked conventional rifling patterns. That rare feature meant that they could well have traveled down the same crudely bored out barrel. I want to stress upon you the Asda connection once again. The bullets are very much... Uh... Sir, so, uh, I'd just like to mention in regard to the Asda connection, uh, the K brothers. There was a robbery at uh, Castleford at a supermarket and they fit the general description uh, of the photographs. And are they resident somewhere in the Leeds area now? I believe so, yes sir. We'd better uh, have a team of officers, uh, Mr Grubb, to have a look at these two and any of their associates just to see if in effect they are the two people that we're looking for. Stephen K had worked at Astor this is where two offences very similar to the John Speed uh, murder taking place, the same weapon had not undoubtedly been used. Uh, Stephen K had left this firm under a cloud and his brother Richard looked identical to the gunman at the scene, so we were very interested in these two men who were extremely violent men, very greedy men and professional criminals. The K brothers home was put under observation. One, two, three. All officers One. stand by. The three suspects are entering the target vehicle. It's an off, off, off. Eyeball. Yeah, eyeball. We're uh, half a dozen cars behind them. They're coming up to the roundabouts. Not the first. Not the first. Car 221, we're coming up to the junction with Marley. Car still heading towards Wakefield, over. Yeah, got you. And it's pissing in here. Car 221, come and take us now. They've had a good look at us. Yes, we just come up now, over. This was no ordinary outing. It took them way out of their territory in West Yorkshire, over 60 miles towards Middlesbrough in Cleveland. Another eyeball with one car cover. Speed is, is off as a light. Yeah. They're speeding up a bit, Shh. heading out towards the motorway. Is he doing it? Shit, he's jumping the lights. He's gone. No, he's in that. To car two, we've lost him. Okay, there you are. Three of them. Right, car one to car two. We've spotted them. 
In fact, they're splitting up. One's going up towards the town centre. The other two have gone left. Yeah, from car one to car two. Can somebody check with the local lads and see if there's anything gone off in the last half hour? Something had gone off. There'd been a robbery. Milgar Control, Whiskey 2-3 receiving. Whiskey 2-3. Whiskey 2-3, pass it. Milgar to Whiskey 2-3, can you go to the A1 southbound via the A58? Intercept a black Ford Capri motorcade. On the road back to Leeds, West Yorkshire police prepared an armed reception. Here it comes. Yeah. Go for it. Driver of the black Capri, pull over, pull over. Driver of the black Capri, pull over, pull over. Stop him, give him up. Driver of the black Capri, we're armed police officers. Can you hear me? Switch off the ignition. Throw the keys out of the driver's window! That's good, now put both your hands outside the window where I can see them. That's good. Driver out of the vehicle. Turn to me. We require to speak to you in connection with an armed robbery. Walk towards me slowly. Keep coming. Stop. Down into a kneeling position. Now lay down, flat on your face, and keep looking at me. Arms out at the side of you in a crucifix. That's good. You'll feel slight pressure on your neck. I won't hurt you. Richard K, put those hands on the table and listen to me. I'm Detective Chief Inspector Grubb from the West Yorkshire Police, Detective Officer Muff. We're arresting you for a robbery for? for a robbery in Millsborough early this afternoon. You're not obliged to say anything. Anything you say will be given in evidence. Come on. Although I never saw the case, any photographs of the case or anything, I, you could tell by the atmosphere that was building up. People were talking in hushed groups in corners away from me and things like that and uh, I knew that the, the two people were being interviewed and uh, of course the excitement starts building up you think you know there's something going on they've, they've got them. Richard you've been followed all day every bit of the day there's been a surveillance team on your back all day and we know exactly where you've been well if you know every move I've made then why are you bothering to ask me where was Richard was not Richard with you at this particular time Okay. Your no, 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 no. You were seen this morning to come out of the house with Terry Early. Your Stephen picked you up in the Black Capri. You set off up the A1 to Middlesbrough where you did a robbery. Did I? Yes, you did. Well, if you know all that, then you'd better do something about it, hadn't you? We are doing something well, about it. Well, then do it or let me go. That's exactly what we are doing, but there's no intention of letting you go. Well, at times they were aggressive and other times they'd cooled down. But uh, the, both the brains seemed to work together. They were twin brothers. And while you were interviewing one, you always had it at the back of your mind. The other one might have been in the cell, but he was talking to him as well. Do you know about robberies, Asta? Some of you mentioned a bit earlier. Well, I think you, you used to work there. You must right. know about those robberies. No, I, I don't know anything about them. 1981 and 1982, two robberies. No. A gun was no, used on I've, both I've, occasions. I've admitted, I've admitted all the other ones, all the other robberies, I've admitted that. OK, I've done that. I did those robberies, but I didn't do the one at Asda, and I knew nothing about that killing. You don't kill, but you'll roam around with loaded guns, doing bad. I don't kill anyone, man. It's not my style. I don't do it. We've got the flat cap. We've got the gun. The jobs you've done, the country gent jobs, you're wearing a, a flat cap. I wouldn't kill a You're copper. roaming around with loaded guns, Richard. Put a wig on you and you're him, Richard. You'll fit perfectly. But you know all about the robberies. You know what they were for. I wouldn't kill a copper. I, I'm, I've... You've admitted all the armed robberies. I've told you I've done the robberies. There's very little difference between having a loaded gun and pulling the trigger. 
And if you've been cornered by a copper... No, it's not me, man. You've got the wrong man. It's not me. I'm satisfied of your right one. All the armed robberies you've asked me about, I've admitted them. I know nothing about that killing. I've got no to do with any murders. I think you did it. I didn't do it, man. I, I don't care. Did I didn't do it. I think he dropped on you that morning, and to make sure you didn't get caught, you shot him. I didn't do cold it. I didn't do it. I don't kill no coppers. I wasn't there, man. I was in bed. Blood. You executed that man, Richard. I didn't do it. The person you saw on the 31st of October 1984 in Kurgut on this parade? No. Okay. They just weren't the two people involved. The letdown is, is unbelievable. You think they've got them, they've got them, you know, they, and it wasn't, you know, it just died. You can see people looking at you and thinking, well, you know, is he right? Is it, are you sure there's not something he's missed? You know, as he, because of the, the trauma of the shooting and, uh, of course, the operation and everything afterwards, is it something that I... That it's changed. The image that I, I've got of the, of the gunman is entirely different to the, the fellow that committed the crime. And I must admit that you do start to doubt yourself, but it's more because of other people's, <laughs> you know, looks and things like that that uh, you start to doubt yourself. The K-twins, between them, were sentenced to 25 years for eight armed robberies, and the inquiry helped to jail ten others for violent crimes. But there was no one thing that could link the brothers to the murder. Well, there were times when we were low, but the experience of being in the police service 34 years tells me that one night you're low and then the next day you have a breakthrough. And we always lived that one day we would get the breakthrough. And one day, the breakthrough came. The analytical team had been linking a series of unsolved jewellery robberies and post office raids. Each of the attacks was armed and violent. At the same time, an informant called North Yorkshire Police to say they should look into the activities of an Irishman, a known criminal, Anthony Eamon Kelly. He was a prospect for the robberies, but he also bore a strong resemblance to the artist's impression of the killer of Sergeant Speed. Kelly uh, was a good suspect because he was a man of violence. He'd been involved in firearms offences. He was a right build. He, he wore the right type of clothing. And he'd lived in the area for some considerable time. And he, he frequently visited uh, warehouses in the market area of Leeds, uh, round about the time that John was murdered. But Anthony Kelly was in Dublin. Over the following four months, West Yorkshire Police, with the help of the Irish Gardaí, observed Mr Kelly and his associates, finding out about their past. John Thorpe, the wounded officer, was then flown out and was taken to see Kelly for himself at work on his street stall. Out of all the people that I had seen prior to that time, Kelly was the one that was the closest. He was certainly the closest in build, um, age-wise, um, he looked very much like the gunman. Anthony Kelly was known to have been in England at the time of the murder. What's more, he visited North Yorkshire frequently to see this man, a wealthy businessman, Gerald Stone. Stone was unknown to the detectives, so they decided to find out more about him. They mounted observations on his home in Fountains Abbey, a famous beauty spot. Stand by, stand by. Got the target in sight. He's on foot. He's approaching the door now. He's into the cafe. Gerald Strong was a very intelligent man. He had many criminal contacts in the Irish Republic, but he wasn't very well known at all in England. I was quite surprised when I went to Dublin and made inquiries, and a large number of the criminal fraternity in Dublin were aware of Stone and what he was doing. A very, a, a very active criminal, I believe, over perhaps 15 years. Yes. Morning, Mr. Gerald Stone. Yes. I'm Detective Chief Inspector Grubb, and this is Detective Inspector Barry Jewett. 
I'm arresting you in connection with armed robberies in what? West and North Yorkshire during the past eight years. I'd like you to come with me now, please. What are you talking really? about? Come with what? Robberies? Mr Stone, for the last eight years, you've been bringing over people from Dublin to commit armed robberies on jewellery shops. friends of mine. What do you mean, jewellery robbery? Yes, the friends of yours, Mr Stone. Friends of yours in crime. That's what the friends in. Uh, uh, uh. Crime? Me? What do I need it for? I've got a business. You've made a lot of money out of crime, Mr. Stone. <laughs> and you've used these Irishmen to commit all these offences. Oh, I don't know where you get it from. Most of the Irish uh, criminals are very easily to talk to. They don't tell you a lot, but they're very easily and very polite. Uh, people like Jiddle Stone, very polite, a very nice man to talk to at stages. But obviously they're lying a lot of times, and you've just got to be persistent. In Gerald Stone's case, that persistence paid off. He began to make confessions. He had set up armed robberies. He's since been sentenced to eight years in jail. Among his possessions was a bank bag. It seemed like one that had been stolen in the Asda supermarket raid. Yes, that's my writing on it. So, Stone was linked to Asda. Kelly was linked to Stone. And the gun used in the Asda raid could well have been the gun used in the murder. What we had to do was get Kelly out of Ireland. And we first of all tried extradition proceedings for a jewellery robbery in the city of Bradford. I think the value was £215,000 worth. And we tried to extradite Kelly to this country. Uh, that went before the Irish court and, and failed for technical legal reasons. And uh, there, thereafter, Kelly was arrested for uh, the Guinness kidnapping affair. It was around midnight that police tracked Mrs. Guinness and three members of the gang who abducted her to a smart Dublin townhouse. Almost immediately, one of the gang emerged from the building, shots were fired, and he was arrested. Detectives from West Yorkshire are expected to fly to Dublin to question some of the men arrested after the kidnapping. They want to see two of them in connection with the shooting of Police Sergeant John Speed in Leeds 18 months ago. We had a difficulty here. We were trying to extradite Kelly from Ireland for an armed robbery offence. That had special problems for us because given that he was really a very hot suspect for our murder, we had something of a dilemma because uh, you can only proceed with those matters for which you extradite. And interviews were difficult in Ireland. We were not able to see Kelly and carry out the requisite enquiries which would have put him in or out of the investigation. Anthony Kelly is now serving a 14-year term in Limerick Jail for his part in the Guinness kidnapping. West Yorkshire Police have six outstanding warrants for his extradition. For almost two years, Kelly remained the prime suspect in the Speed Inquiry. There were many other suspects too, of course, and many other lines of investigation. One began when, ten months after the murder, the Leeds incident room took a call from Cleveland. Well, what it is, we've had an incident occur this afternoon uh, down at the Asda Store car park in Stockton, where an off-duty policeman tackled uh, a man who was armed with a handgun. Where the hell have you been? There's a man over there who's got a gun sticking out of his pocket. It was about 4.30 p.m. Police officer. Let us off! Go on! The man Let's made off. his escape on a motorcycle and was last seen heading towards the A19 southbound. Twelve days later, an armed robbery took place at this post office when a gunman armed with a shotgun stole £2,000. But the main factor was he escaped on a black Suzuki motorcycle, the motorcycle that we were interested in. We found the motorcycle here in Leeds in this water. We got it out of uh, the dam here. We broke it down, found a great many refinements had been put on the cycle. As a result of that, we set up a team from the incident room to visit all motorcycle dealers in the north of England to try and find where these refinements had been purchased. That trail led to Retka, where we eventually found a motorcycle dealer who sold that part. 
Unfortunately, he couldn't put us onto the man who purchased it. That increased the liaison between West Yorkshire and the Cleveland police, and this man then became one of our main murder suspects. Over the next 18 months, there was a series of armed robberies in the Durham and Teesside areas. In each case, a lone gunman had confronted security guards as they'd been making deliveries. There were 11 raids, six of them at supermarkets. The gunman became known as the mechanic. Just as the Suzuki had had refinements added, so in these robberies, someone had tuned up stolen vehicles before using them for getaways. Cleveland and Durham police were so concerned at the armed robberies that they set up Operation Vanguard, a surveillance operation hoping to anticipate the next attack. Head to rear, are you receiving? Yes, receiving, go ahead. The operation went on for six months. It was intense, backed up by firearms units, hugely expensive and without luck. Four times the robber struck at premises not covered by the team. In one attack, he appeared with an accomplice and a postal worker was shot in the back. Eventually, the operation had to be scaled down and the emphasis switched from detection to deterrence. An obvious police presence was provided during cash deliveries. This man, PC Ian Richardson, decided to make a routine check on this car. Kilo from 371, uh, PNC check on the following vehicle. Uh, Ford Escort, Delta Victor November, 275 V Victor. Stupid. Get back! 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 DC Sissons, the man's running across the fields towards Port Lucas Estate. He's just threatened me with a sawn off shotgun. You don't control the wall units. The man is armed with a sawn off shotgun. Proceed with extreme caution. I repeat, the man is armed with a sawn off shotgun. Proceed with extreme caution. Get out! Get out!
of that crash, a number of witnesses, both police and David. people standing around, heard a gunshot coming from the car. And that um, wasn't, there was no evidence of any injury to him until he started collapsing in the holding room. When they loosened his clothing, the gunshot wound was found in the abdomen. Now, there was hardly any bleeding from that gunshot wounding externally, and it's quite obvious from tests later on that uh, all the bleeding had been internal. It is rather ironic that the man that set off this chain of events, PCE and Richardson, who really is the hero of, of this particular part of the story, is the first one trying to revive him when he collapsed in the holding room. I immediately went to the charge office holding area at Stockton, where I saw David Griswith lying on the floor. He was dead then. And I then said, that is the man who killed John Spade. I was utterly convinced when I saw him. David Griswith was 38 at the time of his arrest. He had a son. He was divorced from, from his wife. He had come from this beautiful village of Tholthor. Everybody that knew him told us what a fun-loving sort of man he was. He liked the ladies, and he would help anybody with any problem at all, um, particularly with the vehicles or whatever. He had three convictions going back some years, but our inquiries have revealed that since 1976, he has committed nearly 21 armed robberies and connected incidents right up until the time of his death. A major incident room was set up. Cleveland police knew David Griswith had accomplices. Who were they? Could they be traced before they went to ground? And could they help point to Griswith as the killer of Sergeant Speed? Ray Basham had no doubts. I rang John Conboy in Leeds and said, John, I think we've got your man. I looked at his face. I looked at his description. And I was sure it was him. Call that a good feeling. Call it experience. Call it what you like. Well, I, of course, lived in hopes that he was. When I saw him myself, he looked very good. But, of course, I had to find the evidence and identify that he was the killer. And the only way I could really do that was to identify the second man and have the second man in court when the whole story would come out and no doubt he would then be identified as the gunman. I got a phone call and asked to go up and, and have a look at guys with. Um, I went up there and uh, he looked totally different. There were, there were things about him. The, the, the thing that I'd learned to, by that stage is that if you identified anybody, you had to be absolutely positive. The size of the man was right. He was a big, powerful man. And, uh, but of course, the, the features were wrong because of the autopsy and, and everything else. So I couldn't positively identify him. John Conboy and a team from West Yorkshire went up to Cleveland to take part in the hunt for Griswith's accomplice. During the next two weeks, police arrested 13 people known to be associates of David Griswith. In that fortnight, they unearthed 50 firearms and 3,000 rounds of ammunition, more than twice as much as they'd recovered in the two and a half years of their inquiries. From now on, in the hunt for the accomplice, the police would take no chances. On St. Valentine's Day, three days after Griswith's death, and almost two and a half years after the murder of Sergeant Speed, another of Griswith's acquaintances was driving home. No, Bright. Put your hands in the air. We are armed 
police officers. You will do exactly as I say, or you will be shot. Do you understand me? Keep your hands in the air and walk forward. Do it now. After his arrest, Malcolm Tyerman was found to have bullets of the type used in the Asda supermarket raids. Keep walking. More significantly, he also had bullets of the type used in the murder. You, Adams, you are an associate of Gracewitz. But we have evidence. You see, I haven't just been sat here for the last three or four days since Gracewitz died. Well, we've been working hard. You know the sort of inquiry this is. Sanderson eventually confessed to a number of armed robberies with David Gracewitz and claimed that Gricewith had once bragged to him about killing Sergeant Speed. So, both these men had worked with Gricewith. Was one of them his accomplice on the day of the murder? Have you anything to say? No. But you're in a very serious position. You must have something to say. At that stage, police arrested David Gricewith's girlfriend. After two days of holding back, she told them what she knew. On the day of the murder, David Gricewith had come home wet and with blistered feet. He told her that he'd killed a policeman and he'd hitched a lift from Leeds. That evening, she'd driven him from their house in Tholthorpe back to Leeds. He'd left his car there less than half a mile from where the murder was committed. Then, most dramatic of all, she told detectives who David's accomplice had been that day. Ray Basham called John Conboy, and the statement was read over to detectives from West Yorkshire. And uh, you can pick up from there. That afternoon, three West Yorkshire detectives sat waiting in a lorry park in York, watching as the vehicles came home. They were looking for a truck driver called Paul Guest. We asked to see the work record for Paul Arlingus on the 31st of October 84, so they dug through the ledges and opened it up, and there it were in black and white. On the 31st of October, he wasn't at work. Here it is. Thank you. The manager told us he would be back round about five o'clock, and we'd about two and a half hours, so we sat there, having a cup of coffee, kicking his heels, waiting, and all the thoughts of the murder went back over the two and a half years, all the good suspects that we'd had, and the fact that they'd all come to nothing. Uh, and here we were, sat in the final hours and wondering whether this were our fella. I knew John Speed quite well because um, I was in charge of the burglary squad for um, 18 months in Leeds and John worked for me there as a sergeant. Um, yeah. He was a family man and uh, a nice fella, right nice fella. And, uh, you, it's personal, it becomes personal when a uh, colleague uh, gets shot like that. I'm Detective Sergeant Bancroft from the police at Leeds. I'm arresting you for the murder of Police Sergeant John Richard Speed on Wednesday the 31st of October 1984 at Kirgit. You're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so. Whatever you do say may be taken down in writing and given in evidence. I don't understand. was David Gricewith I was with. It was him that shot the policeman. I couldn't believe what were happening. David shouted at me, run. But I couldn't. 
Then I saw the second policeman running from the arches towards David. David pointed the gun at him. And the policeman threw himself to the ground. David walked up to him. And he just shot him. I was seeing this, but I couldn't believe it were happening. I felt very bad when, the, when it came out, that the fact that Griceworth had been the gunman, because I hadn't identified him. All this time, this two and a half years, I'd been telling everybody that I would know this man, that I would recognise him, and then I didn't recognise him. And the, and, the, and the thing that settled my mind regarding that was at court when uh, Mr Guest made it known that he'd only recognised Griceworth from his hair and his nose, and that was a man who was a close associate of his but he'd failed to recognise him positively on the mortuary slab. So I, I was pleased about that from my own point of view. Guest, for me, could have gone away for the rest of his life, and I think he deserved to. Um, but uh, I don't feel anything for him. It, it, it just doesn't come into my thoughts at all. The thing that somebody took best of all, as we passed the parish church with Guest in the car on the way, Jock Tange just virtually said, and he, he said it to himself as much as anything else, but well, you can rest now, John. We've got him.